Irish Brigade in the Second World War. My name's Richard O'Sullivan, and um, this meeting is to view the activities of the Irish Brigade in Sicily during July and August of 1943, this week being the 77th anniversary of the start of the Operation Husky campaign. First of all, I just wanted to remember the reason why myself and my brother Edmund set up the Irish Brigade website several years ago on behalf of our father, who at the time of the Sicily invasion was CQMS of E Company, 2nd Battalion, London Irish Rifles, CQMS Edmund O'Sullivan. This picture taken from Rome in June 1944. Just a little bit of overview of why the Allies invaded Sicily. By January 43, the concept of Germany first was accepted by all the Allies, certainly skipped by the Americans in overall terms, acceptance of the Germany first campaign. Tunisia was still raging on, and, and Montgomery's 8th Army was still coming from Libya. So there was bitter fighting still going on in Tunisia. But the Casablanca Conference of January 43 brought Churchill and Roosevelt together and their advisors and various other people. So the decision to invade Sicily in the summer, probably June or July, the hope was, um, was taken at Casablanca in January 1943. Why Sicily? Nicknamed, sorry, dubbed Operation Husky. Uh, that was taken over from Whitcord, previous name of the operation, the possible operation. It was to make the Mediterranean lines of communication more secure, clearly at the base of Sicily, in South Italy, quite relatively um, narrow channel, relatively. Diverting German pressure from the Russian front, Stalin, of course, was very keen for this to happen. And uh, uh, Russians, the Soviet army was, Red Army was still facing strong fighting. On the back there, uh, all through 42 and 42 onwards. And intensifying the political pressure and military pressure on Italy, perhaps to knock them out of the war. And this ultimately did happen. The personalities of the invasion of Italy, uh, starting in Sicily, was the commander in chief, General Dwight Eisenhower, on the left there. This photograph was taken in Tunisia, actually in July '43, when the campaign had started. To his right, the Air Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. In the shorts on the third, from the left or second, from the right was uh, General Harold Alexander, well-known figure. He's the depot, the Commander-in-Chief of Eisenhower at this stage and in charge of the ground forces. And on the right, the Naval Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean at that time, Admiral of the Fleet Sir Andrew Cunningham. Coincidentally, he was born in Dublin, but that's a different matter. But that's it. Behind, just, just commenting, there's Walter Bedell Smith. Edel Smith, uh, he, he was supportive of Eisenhower. And Harold Macmillan on the left, you can see in the moustache on the top, just above Eisenhower. So they had a future UK Prime Minister and a future American President in that picture. Below the operational commanders, the task force commanders, 7th Army Commander was George Patton, General George Patton on the left. Distinctive figure, no need to caption him, I think. And Bernard Montgomery, General Bernard Montgomery, was in charge of the mainly British, but with Canadian support, uh, Eighth Army. So the two passport commanders. So when the planners were set up in January to go ahead and look at Sicily, the, the major facets of or requirements was to secure adequate port ports on the coast clearly, um, four major ports. Messina seemed to be out of, out of uh, reach of, of, of Air Force. So it was really Catania, Palermo was considered, and Syracuse, Augusta, jointly put those together, and they're two separate ports. And of course, the airfields to, to be knocked out in the first instance and then to be used later. So when the original plan was put together, you can see this was the original planners who came up with this in the first few months of 1943. The, just the preface with the blue arrows is the American 7th Army. The idea was to land them on the west of the island, in the north, uh, around Palermo, and on the south coast, or the, 
the southern side of Sicily and to capture airfields and the port of Palermo. The, um, the red is the red circles or circular figures are the air, airfields throughout the island and the triangles are the major ports. So. And in the southeast corner was the Eighth Army. So their land is would cover the, the great strip at Gela. So there was air force, air, air bases in that area, very many in that area. And then on the south and southeast coast, right at the tip of Sicily at the base and near Syracuse and the ports of Syracuse and Augusta, Catania being looked at later, hopefully some landings in that area. And Messina, as I say, in the top right corner, very close, two miles from the Italian main line, was about to be out of reach of air cover, so it was not considered in the first plan. But as you can imagine, these sort of plans don't always stand the test of time. The actual invasion, when Montgomery came and looked at the plan, as the Tunisian campaign came to an end in May 43, actually it was considered we should, the, the Allied forces should concentrate their forces in the south and southeast of the island. Just a bit more geography, as you can see from the map, um, Sicily is like a isosceles triangle on its, on its side. So the southern tip to the western tip was about 175 miles. The north coast, 175 miles similarly, and the north-south through from Messina to Syracuse and beyond Pacino was about 130, so that gives you a dimension. So relatively, you could say, quite a small island. But um, So that was the plan and set up for the moon when the moon would be at its best in July. That was the original. So that was the final decision. These splashes here, that blue one there and the Yellow one was uh, the anticipated airborne support. So when the landings would come in by sea, um, that the, the airborne support would have already captured some vital armoured areas inland. In fact, Husky was the biggest invasion of the whole Second World War. Bigger than even than the 6th of July land, 6th of June land is in Normandy. So there was 3,200 ships involved. 115,000 ground troops from the UK and 60,000 Americans, both from the American, sailing directly from the US and from North Africa. Within the 8th Army, there was a Canadian, first Canadian Division's first major operation. So the 8th Army encompassed infantry from both British and Canadian forces. Just a quick look at the German defensive position. In July of 1943, the overall command, 6th Army, was Italian-led General Guzzoni, and they had four Italian divisions inland ready to, to go east or west, and six or more coastal divisions. There were two German divisions on the island, 15th Panzer Grenadiers and the Hermann Göring Regiment. But it was Italian led, that's just a reminder. Very, very quickly, it was seen that um, very quickly after the invasion, German forces were, were enhanced and the parachute regiment would join and uh, other forces would come, another German division would come. But this gives you an idea of the uh, the forces, the Axis forces on the island, defending around 200,000 Italians and about 60,000 German forces. Not all the German forces were active infantry or fighting forces, but they, they were available. And the island split between two corps on the west, General Arisio and the east, General Rossi. Uh, not formally split in a line as such, but uh, German forces or the Italian divisions could be used once the landing became clear where to go. First few days of the invasion, just, just to recap on what the invasion forces are. So there were the Second Corps Americans here under General Bradley, so Patton was the task force commander, but General Omar Bradley, later famous for Normandy and other places, 
was in charge of the landings on this area, south east, um, well, south coast really, moving up the coast to the western tip. Uh, there were 24 breaches altogether from both Allied armies. Um, famous generals within that corps was Omar Bradley, second corps commander, Lucien Truscott, Terry Allen, and Troy Middleton. They were the divisional commanders on day one. Lucien Truscott, of course, later became the uh, commander of the uh, sorry, Fifth Army in Italy. On the seventh uh, uh, seventh, the Eighth Army side under Montgomery, there were four infantry divisions. Uh, on the south and right tip was the 51st Highland Division and the 1st Canadian Infantry Division who landed down here and the 50th Northumbrian Division and the 5th Infantry Division landing near Syracuse and moving up. And as I said, there was airborne landings in both sectors to support, uh, and I won't go into so much detail about that. The the actual landings were very successful, re relatively limited uh, defensive activity, but soon inland, the American forces met counterattacks in this area. Italian forces took over Porto Grande, but then uh, that was recovered. Defensive positions started to harden south of the Cana uh, Catania airfields. But on day one, a relatively good, successful landing and then move inland. The hope was Montgomery's idea was to go up the east coast, east of Mount Etna to Messina as soon as he can, can could. And um, another force west of Etna to cut the island. The American position, rightly or wrongly, in, in, in anyone's eyes, would be very much a a flank guard, and, and Patton was certainly not particularly happy with that, but that's how it stood on, on the first few days of the landings or the invasion. The advances continued, but um, started, as I say, the German offensive positions in both cases of both corps here. The 30th Corps, just to remind, was under General Lees, who later became commander of the 8th Army in Italy, and General Dempsey commanded 13th Corps here. Another famous figure went to Normandy. After a certain amount of discussion about the routes, um, the Americans were, were redirected slightly back to the beach initially, one, part, one division, 45th Division. And then after the 21st of July, they, they were allowed, they were given the green light, greenish light, you might say, um, to, to advance west and cut the island by going directly north. Because of this slight discussion amongst the Allied generals, it, it meant some delay. So it allowed quite a, amount, quite a significant amount of German defensive forces in the west of Ireland to retreat into this area here to the east and started to cement a very strong defensive line, one there being shown, and the succession plan. After the 15th of July, General Huber, who we saw in the first picture, the defensive forces was brought over from the mainland and he took over all command of all German forces on the island and started to bring together some, str some strategic view on how to defend the island in basic idea, defend strongly here along that strong line there and move back gradually and eventually to retreat over the over the Straits of Messina, two miles there. So from the, about the 21st, as I say, the strong line of defensive lines started to solidify here, south of Catania, the airfields, and the famous Battle of Primasoli Bridge, which started on the 14th of July for three days, down like infantry. It was a, a, a precursor of Arnhem, in a sense, two bridges were taken by airborne and were Armour was then meant to come up the road and take them over from, from the airborne. It wasn't entirely successful, and it took three days to, to actually take the two bridges. So, by for the 21st of July, the solidifying line south of Catania meant that um, General Montgomery would call the 78th Division forward from North Africa. 
and they were formally in reserve, but they got the call on the 21st. The 78th Division uh, was one of the original divisions that landed and torch in Tunisia in November 1942, uh, commanded by Vivian Everly. Its symbol was the Battle Axe of Stirling, a very distinctive figure of the Battle Axe and also a very distinctive general at that time, Vivian Everly there. Three infantry div uh, brigades, the 11th Brigade, the 36th Brigade and the 38th Irish Brigade. So that's our first comment today about the Irish Brigade starting to come into the picture. The division started to leave Tunisia around the 25th of July. I'll see that straight line on the map goes through some land, but it gives you a rough idea of what they had to face. And the Irish Brigade themselves left Seuss and Tunisia on the 27th and taken a day to get to the landing beach south of Syracuse. The crossing was extremely rough. One more on the Irish Brigade, who they were. So the Brigade, brigade Commander, Nelson Russell, um, a Royal Irish Fusilier by Burke, had served in the First World War. And the three respective infantry commanding officers, the first Royal Irish Fusiliers, the Fogs, commanded by Beach and Butler, Lieutenant Colonel Beach and Butler. Sixth Royal the Skill and Fusiliers, the Skins, uh, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Neville Graysbrook. And the second London Irish Rifles, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Rogers, that had just taken over from Pat Scott in July. The pitch here is Beecham Butler, Nelson Russell, Graysbrook. Legacy photograph of Pat Scott, who later became the commander of the Irish Brigade, but Harry Rogers is not in that photograph. That was taken as a silly before he took over. And in support of the 78th Division, in particular the Irish Brigade, the 56th Recce in this campaign didn't really take a strong support of the Irish Brigade, but they did support the 78th especially from the advance from Madrano to Maletta. And the artillery, the, the heavy machine guns of the Kensingtons, the company, and the sappers of the Royal Engineers were massively important during this campaign. These, these three components were specifically supportive of the Irish Brigade. The beaches, so south of Syracuse, sorry, I shouldn't have said Syracuse, Syracuse, Ognina Bay is about 10 miles southeast of Syracuse. And my father's description, as quoted, was they called off the ships and quickly got onto the carriers and they started to move towards the center of Sicily. Beautiful location. That was taken, uh, I think, in July, so a similar time we could tell that the weather was hot. So what did, what did the Irish Brigade face and the 78th Division face when they were brought forward to the line? So, as mentioned, General Hoover had put together a strong a strategy, a strong defensive line initially here, and would have successive lines in, in plan all the way back to Messina. So, the American forces had cut the island in half, captured Palermo, and now we're moving on two axes to the east. The Canadians, this was the Canadian division, had, had a, a nice circle around, and now we're advancing east towards Etna. The 78th Division were brought up here, in between, it's not arid here, but the 51st Division and the Canadian Division. The 78th Division was brought up to attack, initially, Chenteripe and the west of Vendasso. The, the rest of the army was held for this period. The strong line, South of Catania Airfield, was holding, and it was felt that there was no wish to keep hitting the head against a brick wall, if can be outflanked somehow, the roads supportive of the German forces around Catania, if that was cut, then they would have to necessarily retreat. So the route the Irish Brigade took to Catania and over, up to that position we saw, was a very uh, roundabout route, but on main roads mostly, apart from this cut through here, Castel de Gutica, uh, to get to Catanova. That's where they had to actually create new roads. Um, you know, you can drive that quite easily, well, over four or five hours, six hours today, as we've done. My father observed that, welcomed by villagers and town folk, the Virginia 
Palazzolo and other places along that route. But as you can imagine, there was some suspicion about who these people were, and especially people wearing corbines and and uh, hackles. Some beautiful places today. These pictures were taken last year. Palazzolo, Vizzini, got um, beautiful Baroque towns. Just an example of what they might have seen as they drove through quickly. So the assaults were starting to emerge. As, as mentioned, the, the, the 13th Corps on the coast was still held here, but the now advances of the Americans were going towards uh, places like Troino, there were heavy battles in this area to the night, um, the 1st Division. The 9th Division was on the north coast. Canadians were coming across the 78th Division here and the 31st. So the, third, the 78th Division is our story, really, including the Irish Brigade. As mentioned, German forces have been brought over from the mainland to reinforce. So the 3rd Parachute Regiment were now placed in this area, along with the Hermann Göring Division. So this is what they were facing at the end of July as they were being brought up to the line, the Irish Brigade and the rest of the 78th Division. The first assaults of um, the 78th Division had started on the evening, well, at the end of July. Uh, the, the hope was to, to take the hilltop town, town of Chancheripe by the 1st of August and the Irish Brigade then would take the running over after that. But the first uh, attacks on Chancheripe were not successful, not fully successful. And uh, so out of the nine infantry battalions in the brigade of the, uh, of the division, 78th Division, in the end, eight of them were, were put into battle. So it was... Uh, a lot of uh, Allied forces, German forces, were could defend in certain strategic areas that they didn't have to uh, put in as many people as you can imagine defensive position. So the skins initially were were the first people to be brought up, as you can see that that place is uh, south of Kathmandu and over. Uh, the skins up the top, you see that bridge in the distance, and this view that we took more recently photographed more recently from probably around that area. So my father described as they're ready to come up and become infantry again after being carried across the island. The attacker sent to repay. And this makes the headlines and, and for many reasons. Of course, just to reiterate that German forces, you know, their major strategy is really to defend the line, the Hoover line to allow the forces close to Catania just to maintain its position while the plans for retreat across the uh, Messina Straits is put in, in hand. On the 2nd of August, after the first sorted attack of the 78th Division, the plan was now to bring the brigade-wide attack of the London Irish, the Fogs and the Skins to attack the whole top town of Chantaripa. And on three fronts, even though it was brigade wide, I mean, it eventually ended up in three separate attacks, you could say. The, the plan was for the London Irish on the left to take over three high points, sort of the, the flank, which would guard the attack of the fogs to the left of the town centre through the cemetery, and then a frontal advance of two, uh, all four battalions of the skin. And when you see the geography in picture, then you will realize that this, um, these ridges here up to 2,000 feet coming down, um, the, you know, the, not down to sea level, but there was uh, the, the high peaks were 2,000 feet. So the three components, but what happened, the skins, I mean, the, the time is on here where they actually need the plan. The skins advanced along a, a ridge line here and got right in front of the towns of, of uh, Chantaripe and started to attack at 4.30 and went straight up the hill. That was uh, A and C company. B and D at the same time would advance along onto that ridge. The London Irish actually only took two of these high points and the third, but it was felt that the, the attack should continue despite the third not being taken. And Almost to plan, later on, as dusk came down, the fogs attacked along a ridge line into the cemetery. And we'll explain a little bit more about each one. 
here. Give you an idea of the <laughs> the look uh, the skins in this case would have of the town of Chentruipe. This is taken from the road coming up from Catena Nova, probably about two miles from the town. And you can see this is the main road, and the fogs took that to some extent, went over that hill. But the skins themselves, I and C, went along this ridge line on the right and went up to 0.640, sorry, peak 0.640 here. And eventually that was the objective of those two companies on the left of the attack. And that's a close up, a closer version of it. Again, this is seven, this is where the skins attacked up sheer cliffs, and the fogs would have gone to the left here. But it gives you an idea of the basic geography and uh, a profile of what the skins saw. They, as repeating really, they advanced up this ridge to 0.640 and then continued their advance across the saddle up to the final advance. And this is a German view from. The ultimate object of a of company A and C was 0.708, 708 meters, and, and therefore that's 2,200 at least feet above sea level. And you can see the the road line, the ridge line that the track that the skins took. On the left, the London Irish, there are two of the hills that they attacked. This view is taken from the cemetery where the fogs did uh, objective, but uh, give you a, again, these high points are maybe 2,000 or more. And uh, you just reiterate the, the climate and the weather was, uh, you know, these attacks were in the day, 18, 90 degrees Fahrenheit at least. Massively humid. Just to repeat, so that's the London Irish objectives on the left. Skins on the right, we've looked at A, a and C companies advance straight up the hill. Um, and the B and D, the other two companies attacked on the right. We haven't mentioned this fog, so their attack went very much on that timing, so near dusk. And their objective is the cemetery. So this view is from where they lined up and they attacked across this small saddle here to the cemetery, as usual. Italian cemetery, high walls on the side with the drop off here. This is the third hill that the London Irish actually didn't take. So, you know, just to repeat, that there's an overview of this area from these hills, but the Germans actually withdrew from these hills before the attack went in. D Company, led by Billy Hanna, went in about eight o'clock, but he was killed immediately on the first advance. They brought their men together and C, Co um, C Company Jimmy Clark took over and um, they eventually got into the cemetery late that night and eventually went down to the north of the town. The skins had successfully attacked on their front, a front of attacked sheer cliffs. This view here is a view from the other side of the cemetery, just to the right of that top picture. Looking back over the town of Chenteripe, you see there's a again there's a a ravine and the separate ridge line of the town you can see there. By three o'clock in the morning on the 3rd of August, the, the town was now taken over completely. Both groups of battalions of the skins had met, sorry, both companies of the skins had met and in the town center and the fogs already got in. You see it's a Mark III tank, and it seems to be one tank that was said to be there in the town during that fighting of the 2nd and 3rd. There was a discussion about the reenactment of one of the characters who said uh, the film unit came along the Thursday afternoon and made the skins kick doors in. So this would obviously be on the Thursday afternoon. And without being boring about it, but the, the, the Cherry Wright descriptive came out soon after, it seems, on new newsreels. It seems that the men themselves may not have picked up on it until later, the use of the word or the, the nickname Cherry Wright. So, the skins came into the town centre, and this is the third view, third of August view of that year, and one photograph we took more recently. Um, you can see not. Houses are there, of course, but the geography is uh, similar. So this is looking northwards. But the actual best viewing point is a bit further along the road, where you look 
off the north side of the Chenteripe mountain top, and you look towards Zetna. So this is what the Irish Brigade would have seen on the afternoon or the morning of the third. So they had two rivers to cross now. As mentioned previously, they were meant to go forward and be take over. I mean, the other brigades that would have, in the original plan, had taken over Chenteripe and the Irish Brigade would take up the running. But because the Irish Brigade had taken the town, it was felt they should go through quickly themselves and start to fight further down and capitalize on the retreat of the German forces. And this is the view they would have had on the third. The town of Vardrano, kind of cloudy as Mount Etna. The town of Aldrano are about 2,000 feet again on that high point there. And two rivers, as mentioned, the Salso River and that bridge, if you can see that, that's, there's a blow up of that picture. The, the, these are two current bridges, but the, the, the line of the old bridge would have been in that area. And the further river is the Semeta, and we talk about that later. But even though the infantry got to the Salso on the 3rd, to actually cement the bridgehead, they, they had to wait for artillery and other arms to come up. And um, uh, the road down from Chantarifu was heavily cratered. So it took you know, over a day before the, the support was uh, available for the crossing of the Salso River. A little bit of current day map, mapping of, of that picture. The picture taken from about here, just in the road down from Chenteripe. The first crossing, the Salso here, and the second crossing of the Semeto here, and in the town of Ardrama, as mentioned. Only from Chenteripe to Semeto, about seven miles. A little bit of descriptive of the attack of the uh, 4th of August. So it took um, the set piece attack over the Salso, took a little while to organize. It's on the 4th of August. This again, this is the river bridge today. Well, an older version of the bridge. Of course, in 1943, the bridge was completely destroyed. So the actual crossing of the river had to be down in there. This is taken in the summer. By August, that river was virtually empty. So the actual crossing wasn't a wet one as such, but it's still tricky. And there were a slight bluff on the north side of the, um, of, of, of the river. But the set piece attack led by the, the London Irish and the Fogs was two o'clock in the afternoon and took a relatively short period of time. And they got over to uh, the north side by, um, by four o'clock. So quite a, relatively simple. Just overall that the, 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 the unhinging of this area started to impact the other parts of the, of, of the campaign, but we'll go on to that. So they, by the time getting to, um, the Sameto, the roads are here where the roads come in for Cantania. So this, the, the actual escape routes or supply routes for the uh, German forces all around uh, the, that are starting to be impacted by this advance. Right, on the 5th, so it took one further day, again, after the Salso battle, uh, the, the London Irish and the Fogs were able to get close to the river very quickly, but it was the 5th with a set-piece battle to advance over the Sameto River start, was starting. London Irish were based at the Karkachi and the fogs on the right hand side of the road. And four o'clock in the afternoon, this is a view from the, uh, from the German positions on the north side. The casino and palace, two, two strong point buildings were noted. And this is from roughly from where the palace is looking back south as to the town of Central Ipe. You can see on the south side of the Sameto, these, these river cliffs coming down quite steep and this is roughly where the fogs are here you can see that line there there'll be a similar river cliff just below that building there so on both sides of the river there were river cliffs so actually this fighting on the fifth was quite intense i mean as you can tell it took several hours in various forms the london irish on the left of looking back on the right but uh, on the left of the attack and the fogs roughly coming across this ground. We're taking the picture from the palace here. And um, so there was, this was actually one of the, in terms of deaths, one of the, the worst days of the Irish Brigade attack. So the fighting went on for several hours. Uh, under the river cliff on the north side, the honeycomb was 
strong points, German strong points. So it was um, tightly held, but uh, recognizing that the German forces were intent was to retreat in general, strategically. So in the end, men, Germans, were, die, were fighting and dying here. This is a view from where the fogs would have started their advance on the South River Cliff, looking towards Sadrana again, which is up here. And their objective is in this area here, the palace and the, and the casino. This building here is the palace, actually. It doesn't look like much of a palace, but it's un you see this is taken about five years ago when the London Irish Association visited. You can see local members there. But um, you can see the Potmark building has been left since 1943 in architects. I won't explain why it was called the Palace or the Casino, but that's the names they were given in 1943. As mentioned, by unhooking the area near the Sumeta River south of Adrana, this meant that German forces now had to, to retreat on both sides of Etna. So this unlocked the door for the 8th Army to move along the East Coast, 13th Corps, some elements of 30th Corps here. This is the 51st Division. The 70th Division, as explained, now at pace was moving around the left side of Etna, the west side. The Canadians were in parallel with the 78th and coming up closely. Two advances of, of the Americans. The 45th had been um, taken over by the 3rd, their advance by the 3rd Division, losing Truscott's men took over this advance on the North Coast. And the 1st Division, the 9th Division took over the 1st, the 9th came as a reinforcement division. But as mentioned, there were some significant battles, especially around the, the area there at Choina. So now, this started to be the final solution of, of the battle, of the campaign. After the 5th, after the Sumeto battle, the 11th and 36th Brigade took the running up and the 56th Recce took the lead and they advanced along the west side of Etna, just towards Randazzo, but they were held up at the last place on that road, Maletto. Just again, the geography, the modern day geography. So that's the Sumeto River. So the 11th and 36th Brigade that 25 miles or so took them to Maletto or south of Maletto, quite close. The Irish Brigade had rested here at, at, um, at the Sumeta River, which actually caused them significant problems from malaria or mosquito bites later. And that's one of the, f the factors of this campaign. Over 10,000 men, allied men, suffered from malaria or hospitalized from malaria, including my father. And this would reoccur throughout his life. Well, his immediate profile life anyway. Um, just a mention of Bronte here. Bronte is an interesting town and one of the highest places on, on the Etna slopes. This comment, uh, the, Lord Nelson was actually the Duke of Bronte and he was given that title in 70, 1799 by the kings of, king of two Sicilies based in Naples. And, uh, but Nelson actually didn't take on ever visit Sicily, but although um, his family, his older brother after his death, took on the title, and, and to the current day there are Dukes of Bronte, and, and that family line kept a residence in Bronte, and it's, it's quite an interesting, strange connection to, to, to Bronte. But that's a, that's a digression on the main narrative. Going back to Maletto, so by the evening of the 11th into the 12th, the, the final knockings of the campaign for the Irish Brigade were coming together, but it's still significant fighting was still required. The road to Randazzo, so the road up from Bronte and Adrano was coming from Bronte was coming along here, and uh, Squeeze Point really, as it went towards Randazzo here. The American forces were coming through from the east. The Canadians were somewhere in this vicinity as well, but they were now being taken out of the final advance. Um, Maletto town, and there were two hilltops just guarding the town here. And uh, uh, on the flank here, a smaller top that was um, used by German artillery. 
to cover that. But the Irish Brigade was take, brought up in the early morning of the 12th, so it was a two-pronged attack of the fogs in London Irish. The skins, again, were taking a, a secondary role in some respects. But during the day, the, the fogs took Capella, one of the hilltops here, and advanced into the town of Maletto. And by the afternoon, had taken over the town of Maletto successfully. The London Irish were late to their forming up point, even mid-morning before they got their act together, and for various reasons, some navigating through lava problems. But they eventually took the high point of Spirina by the afternoon. Uh, in parallel, the skins had been moved up, a stro uh, uh, quite a, a wide flanking movement to go to Lenave. So by the evening of um, the 12th, they got there, but German defensive forces actually disappeared by then. This wasn't the end for, for, the, London, for, the, for the Irish Brigade. There's one more element to, to review. So from that main road, this is a view over to the Etna, from a place called Mortar Corner, on one of the bends of that road. And this is for the London Eye took this Spirina, Monte Spirina, and this is the beautiful view they might have had on, in, on the 12th of August back towards Mount Etna. You can see the little steam coming from the top of Mount Etna. As mentioned, in the early morning of the 13th, there was a final requirement for the fogs who moved along the road towards the Randazzo. And at various points, there was a uh, shoe mines that were there that killed, ultimately killed the commander of one of the company, B Company, and another ambush here where the last three men of the fogs during this campaign had were killed, unfortunately. But by eight, eight o'clock in the morning, they had reached this junction. Americans had come up from the west and the meeting point. And so the final, final fighting for the Irish Brigade was in the evening of the 13th. The Irish Brigade had advanced on this road. And just to mention that last fighting, as mentioned, in the middle of the night, 1.30 in the morning, 13th, as they advanced to Grandazzo, B Company under Lieutenant Bolton ran into the ambush. Three men were killed, the last three men. Graham, Gizia Graham, Lieutenant Bolton, platoon commander, and Gizia Fusilier, Bay Bay Picture of Fletal Graham there. And um, he was from northeast of England, but um, married a lady from Portaferry in County Down. Edward Graham's body was not found, or not confirmed as being found until about four years ago. And he's Headstone was recommemorated at Catania. His two sons, his twin sons, attended that rededication. So the meeting at Randazzo or near Randazzo, there's Everly meeting his American counterparts in the afternoon of the 13th, we believe. And that's the devastation found by the Americans when they moved in, and mostly done, obviously, created by bombing by American and British forces. This isn't quite less than an hour because that view, that building there is slightly to the left of the church there. It's the end of the church, actually. But, um, and that so is a very interesting town to visit. It's the highest town on the edge of the slopes of, of uh, Mount Anna. So the, the final advances of the campaign started to go ahead. And... By the, um, by the 14th, in fact, by the 10th, the Italian forces started to, to um, evacuate the island and German forces gradually. By the 16th evening, General Hoover himself evacuated himself and the final German forces on the island left in the morning, very early in the morning, the 17th. The 3rd Division, the 9th Division Americans and the 51st Highland Division came up, and it was actually the 3rd Division with the 1st into Messina, and General Patton entered at 10 o'clock and received the uh, final surrender. Well, sorry, the surrender of the town of, of, um, of Messina. German forces and Italian forces were all evacuated by that stage. Just to remind ourselves that even though Mussolini was toppled on the 25th from the Precious Ground Council on the 25th of July, Italy was still a combatant and fighting 
uh, alongside Germany. Uh, that would, would soon change, of course, but uh, as of the 17th of August, that was the situation. So it was actually surrender. Meanwhile, the London Irish and the Irish Brigade had rested near Maletto for a few couple of weeks, but then decamped to the north coast, and they had a very nice three weeks on the beach near Pate Train, being reinforced. It gives you an idea of their mood. This is the officer group of the 2nd Battalion of London Irish Rifles. Harry Rogers, the commanding officer, you can see there. Uh, Kevin O'Connor, the second command, who would later be killed in the mainland. Doc Samuels, the doctor. Merlin Davis, a leading figure after what I see, uh, E Company later in Italy. Colin Gibbs, a uh, pre war territorial man, he was um, later involved at uh, Cassino and Trasimena. And Reverend Harry Graydon, the C of E um, Padre of, of that battalion. And there were some, some dodgy moustaches. On evidence there. Just slightly to wrap uh, some of the characters and names and faces. Uh, this is Bobo Crocker, who led a company in the attack on Chenteripe, was was uh, awarded the military cross. And Basil Hewitt, also with a company attacking Chenteripe. Hewitt and Crocker both were killed on the 3rd of November 1943. In, as you, from that sentence, you know, men who, who fought through Tunisia and Sicily later to lose their lives on the mainland of Italy. Same day they were killed near San Salvo. Billy Hanna, we mentioned being killed at the cemetery at Century Pain. He was a, a pre war Ulster rugby player. Joseph Fitzgerald from Dublin, he was a solicitor. He was awarded the military cross for his actions at Sumeta River on the 5th and then was killed near Maletta on the 12th in the advance. Uh, James Merton, no picture here, here from Lurgan. Rifleman, although my father knew him as Corporal, he was a friend of my father's, um, Jimmy Murta. Well, the reason to put his military medal sign station up was actually the 15th of August when this was initiated by the battalion or brigade. He had actually been, he'd actually died. He was wounded at Maletto and died on, as he was on the ship going towards Libya. And he's actually buried at uh, Tripoli Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery. In total, there was about 115 Irish brigade men were killed during this campaign, mostly buried at um, Catania Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery, close to the city of Catania and about 500 casualties. If you, if you say 800 in a battalion and half of which are the, in, the rifle battalion uh, companies, so three, so about 1,200 are combatants in the rifle companies. So 400 casualties, about 30% or so who were killed, wounded. No one was captured during this campaign as far as I know. And on a visit in 2016 to the Catania Cemetery, that's uh, the London Irish Association, quite major. Williams, Robert Williams played a lament and various other tunes at the cemetery. Very moving. This just gives, gives a few of the, the, the whole advance or route of the Irish Brigade in Sicily from south to north, eventually staying on the beach of Patti. Patti. After three weeks on the beach, they moved to Malazzo, the port of Malazzo. That's my brother Edmund and Harry Thompson were filming there quite recently. But this is where they would be shipped to the mainland of Italy on the 25th of September. And that's their route they took on the 25th of September. Before the 25th of September, they came from Malazzo. And uh, obviously not through the land there, went around there. But uh, by that stage, the crossings of the the Strait of Allied Forces commenced on the 3rd. The major landings at Salerno on the 9th of September occurred here, by which stage Italians had signed the surrender at Casabile, announced on the 8th of September. And mentioned Edward Graham, his rededication in October of 2017, attended by his twin sons and the pipes from Royal Irish Regiment. Today's Royal Irish Regiment attended that. Very moving. 
but a very windy day, in fact. And um, just to wrap up this, uh, we, we will have a next Zoom presentation and meeting. Actually, this is a recording of an original meeting, but we have the meeting itself on Monday, the 7th of September at 6 p.m. So if you want to join us then, this next presentation and discussion will be about the August, end of August, September period and into October when the Irish Brigade commenced their campaign in the, um, the mainland of Italy and the fighting at Termini. So please join us on the 7th of September. This is Richard O'Sullivan thanking you for listening to this recording and we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you shortly.